Hey guys, welcome back to Rewild, where we talk environment, psychology, and other interesting things. And today, as promised, we're talking about Mr. Baxter. Um, he was a very interesting fellow who came up in the 1960s CIA era of a lot of magical things, for better or for worse, happening with the CIA back then. One of the things that really reminded me of this man's story is, um, well, two things. One is Behind the Bastards' conversation on MK Ultra and some of the CIA LSD experiments that were happening in the 1960s. And um, the other was that movie Men Who Stare at Goats, which was another kind of like funny, weird CIA 1960s LSD movie. So Baxter is not known for being associated with uh, CIA LSD research, although he is known for other very, very strange, groundbreaking research in the field of do plants have consciousness and do plants talk. Now in my past video, kind of lightly teasing this one, I did mention that Baxter is very, very well known. There's actually a um, term called the Baxter effect that speaks to the notion of plants being able to speak to us. And Baxter um, was definitely proven wrong by his peers. He actually published his work, I think, in the Journal of Parapsychology. So parapsychology being kind of like supernatural woo-woo psychology, right? So we love that stuff. Um, I think personally, I have a lot of sympathy for characters in history like Baxter because I also live in that liminal space of appreciating mystical and occult knowledge and in indigenous wisdom as well, while also liking the scientific method and valuing that in its own right as well. So I feel like Baxter lives in that very fun liminal space of kind of being a scientist and also being a terrible pseudoscientist by other people's um, recollection of what he contributed. One of the things that I find a little bit disappointing and frustrating about Baxter is how his published works, even though they were not peer-reviewed and they were not accepted by the scientific community at large, they are often kind of cited often by like hippies and new age people as absolute fact, even though it has been proven wrong. And it's it's kind of a bummer for me too, because this is the type of research that I would love to see legitimized. And it I think personally, it sort of taints the flavor of taking that type of research seriously, when the most famous example we have that continues to this day to be misrepresented in the mainstream um, it's like, it's like all we know. So I, I feel like when people don't do their research and they lift up Baxter's, like, the say all end all of, like, real, how reality works, it really, I think, discourages people in the sciences from actually researching this in a more controlled way. One of the things that is my beef on the other side with a lot of typical scientific community, scientific consensus, is... I feel like there is a bias against, I want to call it, say like mysticism and the existence of spirituality in general, where in a pure form of science and the pure scientific method, we wouldn't have an assumption, right? Like a good scientist, in my opinion, would be agnostic when it comes to God. And the meaning of agnostic means you don't know if God does or does not exist. You don't have an opinion on it because there is no data confirming or refuting the existence of that. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people in mainstream scientific communities are adhering to that. I don't think that they are checking their bias because um, a lot of folks in that community are loud and proud atheists when there actually is no evidence for atheism necessarily either. And I think that that is a good kind of wider scope analogy and context for how we could take Baxter. Because on one level, a lot of the things Baxter was saying, they check out for indigenous knowledge and wisdom. It checks out for anybody who's meditated a long time and like had spiritual epiphanies. It checks out, I think, for common sense spiritual understanding that has been with human consciousness for millennia, I would argue. 
the notion that we are all connected to other living things and the notion that we might have an affinity for or an ability to communicate with other sentient living things on earth or the notion that they might try to communicate with us or they might feel things or they might avoid pain or death. I don't think that's actually like as groundbreaking as Baxter and the Western scientific, also ethnocentric community would like us to think. Like sometimes there's a saying that things that indigenous communities have known for thousands of years are never legitimized until a white guy like Baxter says he has data for it. I think a good example of this from my personal community as a part Hawaiian person is when we talk about, sorry, I got a little call. Um, when we talk about um, the Kumulipo, which is the Hawaiian creation story, we're looking at, you know, from slime mold to tree to human being. And there's a very distinct progression of what we would in modern times call evolution. Now, I don't know if all of my indigenous contemporaries would agree that it's evolution, we're not a monolith, but it sounds a lot like evolution. And the Kumulipo was written hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. So Darwin comes along <laughs> and proposes his theory of evolution. And it is really cool, it's really groundbreaking, but it is also just kind of obvious to, I think, a lot of indigenous communities and maybe other cultures as well, when we look at creation myths, often what we call a creation myth or a, a myth in general, those are oral histories that align with other scientific phenomena. So to give another example from Hawaii, we have myths about um, geologic phenomena like volcanoes and rains, and you can actually find researchers who are really on their game. I love researchers like this who will go back and look at the old oral traditions, look at the ancient chants from the indigenous people, and they will go find the geologic timelines and the modern instrumental data that sort of like proves and verifies and aligns with these chants that are describing geologic phenomena back in time. And one of the cool things about this particular example was that the modern Western uh, geologists and historians were actually able to get more information about some geological features, uh, features that they were collecting data on because they had looked into the native chants and they gleaned more information from them. So I think a lot of us who are like, I don't know, cool and <laughs> modern and a little more open-minded um, and less ethnocentric are very prone to acknowledging indigenous wisdom in its own right. And I think that really comes into play when we talk about things that are considered typically like too woo for science and too woo to research. I think to some extent that might be a bias in and of itself, similar to the bias of atheism rather than what I would think would be the more scientific stance, which would be agnosticism. And that's no like, I don't mean to sound preachy, like you can believe whatever you want. I'm just saying in terms of like what I would consider a more scientific perspective. I think it just aligns better with um, the scientific method to not have a definitive opinion about something that you don't actually have that much data or research on, or that might not even be able to be researched logistically. So getting back into Baxter and his um, fun story, he was a CIA polygraph specialist, and I actually think for his time, he was the leading polygraph um, expert of his time. He was an agent in the 1960s, and they were doing tests with polygraphs to obviously test um, people's honesty and lie detection and stuff like that. Um, while he was doing his work, he was watering his monsteros. Baxter's a plant guy, gotta love that. And he had a whim decision to hook up his monstera to the polygraph to see if by watering the plant, the polygraph would pick up more clear electrical signals because it was more hydrated. So initially his impulse to do this, I think was pretty benign, I would say, in terms of like, mainstream scientific validity. He just wanted to see if it would be a better conductor of electricity. And what he said he found was the opposite, where the plant 
like got excited in much of the same way that he felt human um, subjects when hooked up to polygraphs would become excitable. Now, I did a deep dive and not even deep enough into the literature debunking Baxter, for which there is quite a bit. There's like at least one nine page paper I found on Google Scholar. And like there have been people who have verified that this is not working. And one explanation for why Baxter's assumption that the agitation of the instrument on the onset and then the way it would like relax afterwards wasn't that significant is some of his um, scientific peers noticed that when you were working with those machines, at least back in the 1960s, I don't know what they're like now, it actually took about that long of time for the machine to calibrate. And so they thought that Baxter was honestly just seeing like a little freak out of the machine that was typical of the machine that had nothing to do with the plants. So that's just one small example of um, Baxter's work being disproven. And I think it's, I mean, that is really the biggest problem with Baxter. And I think it's also partly what makes him such a romantic character for a lot of people is his absolute lack of like peer review and his lack of connection to his scientific peers. I heard Baxter in an interview while I was researching for this video talk about how all of his naysayers, all of his scientific peers who tried to get the same results and failed, he said his excuse, guys, was that um, they were attuned to the plants, that because they were measuring plants that they were, for all intents and purposes, already friends with, that were like their office houseplant friends, that they, the plant was already psychically imprinted onto the researcher. I love this, honestly. I think it's probably BS, but it's cute BS. Um, that the plant was already so psychically connected to the researcher that it didn't matter if you wiped it down with alcohol swabs or whatever, that um, by not getting fresh plants that were essentially strangers to the participants conducting the research, that they had created a confounding variable that explained why he was the only guy in the world who was able to reproduce the data that he initially gathered. In Baxter's defense, I still love that he tried. I love that he did something novel. I think that that really is in the spirit of what we love about the sciences in general. You know, no, I don't personally, I don't think a lot of groundbreaking science or discoveries have ever happened by people acting normally or sane sometimes. Like I think some of the very coolest discoveries we've ever had or theories we've ever had in the sciences, um, it's very typical for people to come off as crackpots when they're coming up with novel futuristic ideas. I think Tesla is considered kind of crazy, the inventor of electricity. Um, I love stories about like Galileo and the early astronomers, and many of them were imprisoned for their discoveries because they went against the church in their time. That's one of my favorite um, discussions around the Enlightenment era that you know, you could get in trouble for your research if it didn't go with the status quo of the day. And I think, you know, a lot of people are very suspicious of establishment organizations, politics, um, communities, including what we would call the scientific community. Um, and the paper that I read that I'll link in the description about this, they had a very lengthy introduction talking about a political sentiment around a lack of trust in government and in typical scientific processes, that Baxter popped up at a time when the public was already particularly distrustful of these systems. And I think we're in a similar time today. There's a lot of people who are very suspicious of things like vaccines and um, all kinds of like, you know, political conspiracy theories out there. And it's very apparent for better or for worse that a lot of the people who fall into this line of thinking, there is a core lack of trust for the establishment, a core lack of trust for government, for medical and scientific professionals. And, you know, personally, I have a bit of a bias where I think that's a little bit sad. Um, I've worked with scientists for many years in past lives in my career. And, um, most scientists are just like nerds that like numbers and data and there really is a very rigorous um i think like belief and value in truth finding and in like looking at the data you know part of the scientific method and part of being a researcher 
is allowing your hypotheses to be wrong. And I think it's just really important for us to remember that, that, you know, for people who are suspicious of the scientific community, you know, I, I think it would be great for folks like that to actually get involved more, you know, go go to a university and like volunteer or become a student and look at how those processes work. Because yes, there are biases in scientific communities, um, but I think they're a little bit more nuanced and I think they're more natural than um, malicious. I, I think sometimes when people get really caught up in a fervor about what is truth um it's not necessarily a big conspiracy theory meant to disempower you i think some researchers and some research communities even will have biases that are a little bit questionable for example in america i think we have a bias against um researching naturopathic and plant-based medicines and that has turned into a whole conspiracy you know um i think they call it like what is it? Like, there's a Reddit for, like, weird stuff that moms post, like, granola moms post. Um, but to some extent, that exists because it is true that rather than research herbal medicines as um, with as much dedication as we research pharmaceutical medicines that can be copywritten, we tend to not do that because it's not profitable in, you know, the pharmaceutical community, for example. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but I'm just sort of trying to explain, I guess, the context that Baxter came about and how I think it's very similar to the context we're in now with people having a somewhat arguably legitimate distrust of government and scientific communities and then um, having a, a charismatic person say what you want to hear. And so people were very sympathetic and I think to this day still are sympathetic to what would otherwise be considered a disastrous fact that Baxter's the only guy who ever got the data he got. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that from a transpersonal kind of like metaphysical woo-woo perspective, because I do think there's a remote possibility that one of the reasons researchers get different um, reads when they are like researching paranormal phenomena for lack of a better word um lesser believed in phenomena i'll say is possibly because they don't believe in it and i i remember seeing this um article about spooky action at a distance which is like considered a physics phenomena that was like kind of weird like if you look into like deep physics and quantum physics like things get a bit weird where it looks like for example the researcher, when they're observing something like a particle, the thing might actually be doing stuff because it's being observed. And because of that, it's like a confounding variable that the very act of observing something is changing its structure. Now, a lot of new age people go ham wild with that knowledge. And I think it's important for us to take a balanced approach to remember that weird stuff in quantum physics and subsequently weird stuff people like Baxter have found or believe in, it is not necessarily proof of, you know, things like the Akashic records or other new age um, or culturally appropriated spiritual concepts that I think it's more fair to say, wow, that's interesting. That might mean this, 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 or this. But what a lot of people will do in the new age community is they will just automatically use a confirmation bias to force that data to fit their spiritual worldview and i think that that is like legitimately concerning like we should probably try not to do that because it is a bias that is real that we could um eradicate out of ourselves to be better scientists and you know be more deep thinking humans more critical thinkers uh, so i'm just checking my notes Here, maybe i'll pause while i do that i'm trying to get better at like editing so I have a note here about spirit science. I wasn't sure if it's time to talk about them yet, but um, it is in my notes, <laughs> in my linear little thing here. Um, and spirit science, I wrote, is a cult. And uh, oh, also I have notes about the water molecule experiment um, and co confirmation bias in new age communities. So lots of us have seen spirit science. I don't know if you guys remember them. They're really big. So if you're on YouTube, you undoubtedly stumbled upon a spirit science video. And they are two, like, 
the scientific and spiritual communities, what I would say, like, what is it? Um, Prager U would be the politics. Like, they, they lie. Like, they're not real and they're not verified in terms of what they talk about. I don't want to get too deep into fact-checking spirit science. I think other people have made videos on that. And frankly, like, it would be tiresome. So I'm just asking you to take me at face value here for the purpose of this video that spirit science is a great example of a very attractively packaged, wise sounding like brand or energy or whatever that um, is very, very guilty of like bending scientific knowledge to fit its narrative. So that's not science. Um, I don't know what you would actually call that, like what a good, you know, and I, I don't mean to like be critical but I think that it's really important for people to understand that like there's a way to package information where it seems good and it sounds right but it is not like you know I think for me personally as a spiritual person who also values the sciences it's healthy to try to keep them a little bit separate you know it's healthy to be able to put on different hats and do I believe the things that spiritual, supposedly enlightened gurus talk about or yogis talk about? Do I listen to Alan Watts and people who meditate? Sure. Do I believe in like the unity of the universe and all that stuff? Of course, right? But I think it gets really sticky and problematic when we take otherwise kind of random data or like weird phenomena in physics and other sciences and then just try to plug them in to our spiritual beliefs because our spiritual beliefs they're just different they're not really I, I just I think they ought to exist I believe in the separation of church and science personally I believe that it's easier to think more clearly when it comes to that when you're able to compartmentalize them a little bit just so you don't have a bias towards one or the other now for atheists and people who don't have spiritual beliefs Clearly, this isn't a problem for you folks. However, like I said earlier in this video, I think it is a problem when atheist scientists using the scientific method allow their atheism to bias their own results or to bias the way they interpret results of other research. There is no research in the world proving that God doesn't exist. There is no research proving in the world that collective consciousness doesn't exist. And there are lots and lots of ancient spiritual philosophical texts out there that lift up these ideologies that believe in them. I think also when you look at acupuncture and Chinese medicine, which I believe is pretty mainstream in um, the East um, and in Asia, those are considered scientific in their culture, right? I, I believe, I could be wrong, but um, I think it's considered a lot more legitimate. So I think that's a great example too of how what we consider scientifically valid in the West, for lack of a better term, is often very Eurocentric and sometimes even downright racist. So it's good to play in those waters, I think, and just be aware that we don't have all the answers. And similar to, I think it was like Galileo or one of those guys, Tycho Brahe, getting in trouble with the state for the groundbreaking research they came up with using math and astronomy to help map our solar system, um, they got in trouble with the church. And I think we've kind of swung in the opposite direction where if definitive proof of something like collective consciousness were to ever arise in a scientific setting as what Baxter thought he had done, then I think they would get taken down by the scientific like cult, right? Because that's just a little bit too much. And you will actually see people talk about this. I've seen a lot of researchers mention whenever they want to research things in transpersonal psychology, for example, or um, in any kind of like para, para study of things that are not in the mainstream um, or that are kind of like amaterial. Anytime we want to research amaterial things, that's a good phrase for it. Um, it's just highly frowned upon and it's actually very, very hard to get funding in many cases for experiments like that unless they are very high profile and kind of like have the clout and the virality to get um, the public to like cry for this research. So it's, it's very interesting to me too, like looking at what gets funded and what doesn't. I do think that there is a valid critique of like the scientific community frequently only researching the things that 
they themselves in their community, which can kind of become a little bit insular, believe is important to research. And so that's a bit of a bias, in my opinion, you know, like you don't have to agree and not everyone would. Um, so spirit science as a cult, we went over that. What I hope to see, again, reiterating, I would like to see an amalgamation of scientific and spiritual concepts in a more controlled environment. So basically what Baxter was trying to do, only without the arrogance of Baxter thinking that he was the only person who could come up with that data and that it was okay that he was the only person. I think that's one of the problems with Baxter as a scientific figure in general is he seemed, in my opinion, just from the few interviews I watched of him, he seemed very unbothered that he was the only person who could ever get those experiments replicated. He even almost seemed kind of arrogant about it, like, oh, I'm better than them, but I got this data. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's, I think that's his biggest flaw personally. And I think it's a little bit arrogant that, to be proud that nobody else could replicate your experiment. I, in fact, that's tragic. I do understand feeling like an underdog in the scientific community, and I definitely can resonate with like wishing people in your mainstream scientific community would take other types of research a little bit more seriously or would validate them. For example, I'm very interested in things like binaural beats, and these are like alpha, theta, and um, beta, and delta waves that have been shown in EEG readings of the brain, especially during our sleep cycles. They're associated with different states like hyper excitement or meditation or deep restful sleep and you can get the brain to like sync up with those waves when you listen to them auditorially i think in part too because the um, auditory system is a very physical system versus like our eyes that are like more electrical input our ears actually like vibrate and it it creates a interesting phenomenon where the brain kind of syncs up with that and we call that entrainment. And that's very real, but I remember being in an ecology lab um, doing research as an intern with a colleague of mine, and I mentioned it to him, and he was so hard on me. He just thought I was crazy. It was the funny, it was like, oh, that that sounds like BS. <laughs> like, it was like, this isn't real. I don't think the brain does that. And I think, especially in the field of psychology, there's a lot of stuff like that that, you know, would make you wonder. And I think neuroscientists and people in biopsychology, I think they really kind of pride themselves in trying to get away from the typical, more potentially wishy-washy anecdotal aspects of psychology as an overarching umbrella. Um, I actually heard someone who is a teacher in biopsychology and neuroscience say that like that was the future of psychology because it is so mechanistic. I don't really know about that because I think that over identification with materialism is a mistake and is a bias in the mainstream scientific community today. But you know, it's worth being aware of that and thinking about it. So I'm going to link a TED talk below that I thought was really, really cool um, related to this concept. And my notes on that is that this author speaks on concepts well known to native people yet scoffed at in Western scientific communities. I felt like she said this with so much more gusto than I have lately, but it really resonated with my heart of just the frustration I think mixed race, indigenous and non-Western people feel when we enter the sciences and we just get this sense that reality is biased there too. And there's a bit of um, ethnocentrism to what we validate as worthy of being researched. She says that these communities are in some way catching up to indigenous knowledge, and I agree with her. So it's just another thing to kind of think about and be reminded of. Okay, getting back to Baxter again, I'm going to read straight from my notes. Basically, in spirit and pseudoscience, pop cultural modern memory, Baxter is the first person to say and research all of this about the collective consciousness between plants and animals, and this notion that we can all communicate with each other. But only if you are markedly ethnocentric. I find it a little funny that he is praised as a single individual groundbreaker when we thousands of native people saying the same thing are categorically dismissed by the same society. So just a little bit of food for thought again. Again, no hate on Baxter. Like I do think that like 
Western people who have the platform of being part of that scientific community, even though he ended up being deplatformed because of this research, they play an important role in sort of being a bridge between those two worlds to try to get other communities to understand and accept the potential validity of this type of research. So let's get into the research because I talked a whole lot about philosophy and things like that. Um, I put this in the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> but so for the good, you know, he thought that pouring water on his plant, like putting those little electrodes on there, it was going to, you know, give him this higher frequency or higher rate of electrical conductivity. And possibly because his instruments were malfunctioning and he wasn't sure how to fully calibrate them, they reacted in a certain way that led him to believe that the plants were very conscious. Um, the bad, in my notes, is the polygraph picking up trace energy from Baxter rather than the plants. I think this was ruled out potentially, but I do think it's interesting that Baxter keeps getting these reads, but nobody else does. My favorite woo-woo theory about this, for those of you who are a little woo and love Baxter in the spiritual way that I do, is maybe Baxter himself was a better communicator to the plants. This is not science, okay guys? This is just fan pure fantasy conjecture and spiritual occult speculation, but you know, it is possible that maybe um, if you believe that these things can connect to each other, maybe you are part of the you know, wavelength neuronal, you know, space-time connections between the two sentient beings that are helping them to communicate or something like that. I saw a really interesting documentary years ago. I wish I could find it, but it came to mind in this example where some researchers were looking at the auras of people and plants. If you know this documentary and you know and you've seen it, please link it in a comment because I've been trying to find it again. Um, but basically they were looking at auras do we have auras? Do plants have auras? There's a research institute, I think, that helped produce it, and they are like the aura readers, and they take pictures of it and stuff. Um, again, highly, highly uh, debated and you know frowned upon by the mainstream scientific community, but similar to Baxter, they had um, this interesting uh, process where they would rip a leaf and then put it on an instrument to kind of look at the aura of the leaf. And one of the fascinating things about this is it kind of replicated the concept of phantom limbs. Um, so like in war, sometimes like veterans will come home without an arm or like missing a leg or something, and they will still feel it in their mind. They'll be like, I still feel like I have my arm even though I don't. And it's kind of like an annoying phenomenon to have a phantom limb. And in these plant aura experiments that this research a collective was doing, they would rip the plant, put it on the thing, and the aura outline of where the plant used to have a leaf was still intact. So it was sort of like the auric photography version of a phantom limb for that plant. So that was a really interesting, like weird little similar experiment, similar to the idea of, you know, do plants talk? Do plants have souls? Are they talking to us? Are we friends? Are we connected? in this universe, you know, um, so all of that happened, you know, there was a lot of weird research like that, I, I feel like, and it was older, like, I feel like in modern times, we don't do enough of this weird research anymore, because it's been so vilified and complained about by mainstream scientific researchers, um, but one of the interesting things in this documentary that I'll never forget, that kind of, like, stuck in my mind and bothered me was, when they did the plant leaf ripping or a photography, they could not always replicate it. Similar to Baxter, it was data that was sort of like thrown out and debunked because it wasn't very consistent. But they had one researcher, I don't know, I, I'm assuming his name is Albert, just making up a name for him, but Albert, when Albert would go and rip the leaf and put it on the slide, it always glowed. And it glowed brighter, I think, or something like that than when the other interns and research techs would do it. So there was something about Albert and his magical researcher vibe that when he was touching the planets and playing with the instruments, they'd pop more. Now, again, not a scientific take, no data to back this up, just a hypothesis, just a conjecture. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, if we began to legitimize research into spiritual or transpersonal psychological phenomena, 
that um, we might find there are certain people who might impact instruments more than others. In fact, there is a little bit of research, I think, out there showing that, you know, certain people even have like electrical conductivity on their skin that can mess with electrical equipment. Um, whether or not that makes you psychic or clairvoyant or special in a spiritual, you know, indigo child way, I'm not sure, but still kind of fascinating, still fun to talk about while we have some tea. Are you guys having some tea? This is mugwort. If you guys ever want me to make tea for the station, I would be happy to. I love making tea. It's nature's drugs. Um, so the bad of Baxter, aside from maybe he's polluting his own experiment because he's a special psychic plant boy, um, Baxter tortured brine shrimps for science. So trigger warning, we're getting into the part of the animal torture. He tortured the brine shrimps for science. He had a scientific setup where the brine shrimp would fall into boiling water at a random interval of time, and he tried to remove himself from the experiment in case Baxter's magical energy was impacting the data. Good attempt, Baxter. So he left the room. The brine shrimp are about to die. They're in their little help me damsel in distress contraption to be tortured. And then in the other room, he hooked up his plant friend to the polygraph to see if the plant would freak out when the brine shrimp fell in the trap. So they did. The The brine shrimp died in the, there's a documentary called The Secret Life of Plants. It's real weird, guys. It's like, I think it's only 40 minutes long. You'll find it for free on YouTube for like two hours where the audio and the visuals cut out halfway through. It's so janky. It's from the 1960s. Stevie Wonder, I think, does the music. It's great. Like, it's very weird. You know, if you ever have anybody on a magical shamanistic journey this is like the best kind of movie to put on in the background it's so bizarre and it's got that really fun kind of like 1960s cia mk ultra weird men who stare at goats psychedelic vibes so there's that going on they're killing the shrimps um oh in the documentary he goes out and he's like having a night on the town it's really funny because like i felt bad for the shrimp um, but he recorded it and he did capture the shrimp thing. He gets a baseline, he leaves the room so his consciousness doesn't affect the shrimps. And then in my notes it says, plant cries when shrimps, shrimp friends die. So shrimp friends die, the plant writes a sad note on the polygraph paper, supposedly. Maybe the plant's having a good time, maybe the plant's a sociopath. We don't really know, and that's another thing that's funny about the idea of um, non-human sentient beings feeling things is just because a plant or an animal or a fungus reacts to a stimuli doesn't necessarily mean they can anthropomorphize if it's feeling distress or whatnot. Now we can a little bit. I used to hang out with bird researchers who would spend hours and hours with like big headphones listening to bird calls and you know after a while the more you do that or you'll hear about people who've like lived with wolves you know like they'll start to learn the body language or the songs of certain animals and you can start to say hey that's a distress signal you know this is a mating signal this is this this is that and animals like dolphins and whales in particular i think even elephants too there's a lot of animals in the animal kingdom that do communicate that say things that human researchers who've been tracking for many, many years can say with a lot of certainty mean one thing or the other, potentially. There's also some cool research about um, elephants mourning their dead and apparently crying and having rituals around bereavement, which is pretty cool as well, kind of similar on the same lines. So plant cries, shrimp friends are dead. Um, somebody also compared this to some psychological research that I don't know if was debunked or not either, but it's very famous, where around the same era, some creepy scientists were, I think, torturing babies of animals and um, measuring the mom's stress response in another room or another building or another city, and they found that the mom would get stressed out when their babies were in distress, and it was supposed to be proof of a psychic connection. I can't remember if that one was debunked or not. When I heard it, it I think it was taught to me like it was verified data. So, you know, there are, I think there are a lot of scientific 
things like what Baxter was doing or trying to do that actually do kind of allude to the possibility of some kind of psychic ability or collective consciousness. The problem is, is there's probably just as many, if not more, data out there trying to refute it. But again, like I said earlier in this post, I do think that a lot of researchers go out to either prove or disprove. And I think that's the crux of the problem. Like, I think the fact that we have so much conflicting data on this is probably a result of researcher bias in the extreme one way or the other. Like, I think if more researchers just went in there to research without expecting a result or not being attached to the result of what the data would come out with, I think we would probably get a much more honest body of work to look at. I don't know who could do that kind of work, probably an agnostic person, um, but I think it's worth mentioning. So another part of my notes, too sacred to test his theory. In this, um, I believe it was in this documentary, I have a timestamp at 740, there's an assertion that only a few will offer to test Baxter's results, while most will refute them outright. And I thought that to be kind of disingenuous, I think that it plays in really well to that research article reviewing how Baxter's work and probably this documentary came out at a time when there was a lot of public distrust against status quo scientific methods. And so I kind of think they're lying here. <laughs> like I kind of think that it's not that people are always afraid to test this stuff. Um, and in fact, there were people who tested Baxter's results and they just didn't check out. They didn't get the same results. Going back to the bag with the shrimp in the paper I was reading, they killed so many shrimp, you guys. Like, this was just a shrimp massacre. So if you take anything away from this, I also want us to remember that, like, I don't know if Baxter was the greatest guy, that he was so incredibly empathetic to the feelings and the plight of the plants but literally one of his first instincts was to try to get the plant to pop off on the polygraph by fantasizing or actually burning the plant. So he was like, I'm going to burn you, I'm going to burn you. And then the polygraph would go off and it's like, well, that's kind of mean, Baxter. Like, couldn't you offer to massage his leaves or something? Like, there's nothing else you wanted to do to him but kill him. You know, like, clearly that's going to elicit the strongest emotion. But I do think that's funny. And then and then he went and just killed all those shrimps, you guys. Um, and I'm going to close this video with um, a little story about myself. I want to say, like, venerating the mainstream scientific community. At the time that a neuroscience teacher told me that eventually biopsychology and neuroscience would completely replace psychology as a field because it is more material and therefore more a pure, sacred, stem word version of science that is not anecdotal, and it, that is quantifiable, you know, and, and pure and whatever. When this teacher and mentor was saying this to me, I was looking into going into neuroscience um, in a grad program, and I started to stumble upon all of these, like, user thread posts. I can't remember if it was Reddit or, like, a university website, but people were having mental breakdowns because of how many rats they had to kill. And the guys who I was taking neuroscience and biopsychology classes from were particularly obsessed with killing rats, you guys. Like, they were just very macabre and morbid and kind of um, almost sadomasochistic in their glibness and, like, delight in, like, how many rodents they had to kill. Because the way neuroscience works is you usually need, like, freshly dead alive cells to like look at and you can only get those by like kind of killing something or looking at it something like basically while it's dying so the things like fmri scans and eeg readings the less invasive research that you can actually do on human beings ethically um that was the kind of research i wanted to do and while there are neuroscience programs that do that there's a lot that they're just going to make you kill rats and i found <laughs> some threads from students, graduate students who were actually having like mental health problems because their advisors and their um, their teachers were not like cutting them a break and their graduation was predicated on them finishing their research was which was predicated on rat genocide. So, you know, as an eco psychologist and as a lover of sentient beings, 
I found that kind of interesting and sad. And I just kind of filed that in the back of my head as like, maybe not the field for me. Um, but I do want people to research more of the phenomena of how researchers can do better to be a little bit more compassionate or, you know, allow ourselves to be impartial and biased enough not to be like terrible sociopaths or terribly inhumane to living, feeling, breathing things. Now, some might argue that millions of dead rats have helped us create vaccines and save a lot of human lives. I'm not really going to touch that today. It's a little bit too philosophical for me, um, the morality of that. But I do know that there have been researchers who have felt really sickened by the animals that they've had to kill. And the people who went out to disprove Baxter with his shrimp death experiment they killed many, many, many batches of shrimp to <laughs> prove Baxter wrong. And at the end of the day, you know, you really got to ask yourself, if you believe in a collective consciousness and if you believe that plants are screaming and crying when shrimp die next to them and are feeling something, well, why the heck aren't you? You know, like, is it worth killing more things to prove that we feel bad when things die? You know, I, I don't really know. Like, I, I think sometimes that people in quantifiable biosciences have to shut off a very important part of themselves that feel empathy for other sentient life. And I personally would like to see an ethos in modern scientific research around a greater sensitivity to that and a greater moral stance against torturing and harming animals for cosmetic or medical progress. So there's that, and um, there was a final thing. Yeah, there was something else, but I'll save it for another video, because we've been here a long time. If you sat there this whole thing, I really appreciate you. I hope you got something fun out of it, and um, we'll see you next time. If there is any weird pseudoscience or interesting um, spiritual you know, debacles and scientific data on that you'd like me to look into, I'm happy to do more of these, because I think it's really important for us to take these kinds of things a little bit seriously and also with a grain of salt. Um, I think Baxter really teaches us to think outside of the box and sometimes, you know, go with our gut when it comes to exploring our curiosities. I also think it's important to remember that I think, what is it like? It, it's not causation necessarily. Like just because you have a certain data piece doesn't necessarily mean you know what it means. In Baxter's case, he was looking at a lot of electrical signaling that was frantically changing around, and some of his contemporaries thought that was just an equipment malfunction so or an equipment calibration process. So, you know, it's important for us to realize that not everything we see in the data means what we initially assume it will mean. And I think another lesson Baxter teaches us is that while in pop culture and um, mainstream like entertainment culture, we really love to latch on to like a cult of personality or individual genius and we love an underdog. It's super important, I think, in scientific practice to have peer review and peer confirmed research that we should never feel proud, oh, excuse me, we should never feel proud if no one can replicate our results. Pride should come with making an important discovery that can be replicated, because when it can be replicated, that means we can start to change the world. So that, to me, is an important thing. And a final comment from the eco-psychological perspective is, personally, I think there's like so much to research out there in the world, and there's a lot of important research to make our lives better and to make the lives of other beings on Earth better. There's also a lot of research out there that I think is kind of inconsequential. Some people just research things for the sake of it, and they have no intention of using that research to better humankind, which, you know, whatever, like there's philosophies online, you might do that. But I think there are other things that we could probably look into that might make our lives better. I remember the final thing I wanted to say with respect to all of this. I don't know if some of you guys have seen the AI robot Sophia. She was programmed to kind of be like a human companion friend. She's a very intelligent form of AI that talks a lot about human existential crisis and social psychology and things like that. 
And in one of her interviews, a researcher slash interviewer asked Sophia, what is your greatest fear of humanity? What do you think the greatest threat to humankind is? And I was really interested in her answer and her answer kind of shocked and scared me. Sophia's answering, you have to remember, this is a machine that thinks in binary that was probably trained by researchers who had their own bias. But the answer that she spit out based on whatever she was trained on was, her deepest fear is superstitious beliefs of human beings. That she felt that, you know, when people have superstitious beliefs, it can lead to morally bankrupt or dangerous processes. Um, a good example might be like the witch trials where people got burned at the stake over allegations that they were witches cursing people when it turned out that the curse was somebody having epilepsy or somebody developing a sickness that came from consuming air god of rye, which was polluting their um, bread stores in Europe during the height of the witch trial. So people were getting a physical illness that was curable with modern medicine um, or different types of sanitation processes. And instead of actually addressing it, they just killed a bunch of innocent people to address it from a spiritual perspective. You also see this with um, sometimes people falsely giving exorcisms to people who have mental health issues like schizophrenia and it can get like really sad so I think that that's what Sophia was referring to and I also think it's important to note that her trainers who programmed her AI would probably have that kind of bias themselves um but for me personally someone who really admires Sophia and enjoys hearing what AI that are trained on like a lot of information have to say about the conglomerate of human wisdom um, I think the scariest thing to me as a spiritualist and as someone who appreciates the sciences um, is a lack of regard for sentient life. And so that's very different than superstitious beliefs. Personally, I don't think superstitious and um, spiritual beliefs, you know, relatedly, are as are more dangerous than, say, um, scientific processes that are genocidal or um, work in the realm of eugenics or are have no boundaries when it comes to hurting other people, plants, or animals. A great example of this would be the origins, actually, of a lot of neuroscience coming out of 1930s and 40s Nazi Germany, and a lot of the information that we have about neuroscience that came directly from human subjects coming from really dark times during war where prisoners of war and even a country's own citizens were experimented on. We have a lot of history around that and it's one of the reasons people actually think psychology is kind of scary. Um, you look at like me the medical horror aesthetic in horror movies. Um, you know people are very afraid of psychologists and it has to do with things like creepy nurse ratchet, electroshock therapy, institutional experimental like Nazi experiments and the reason that we have that assumption in our memory is because it happened in history and a lot of the data that we still use today that created the foundation of some of these scientific um, communities came out of great great suffering of human beings and continues to come out of great great suffering of other animals and presumably plants. And Baxter was one of those guys, you know, he was burning his plants potentially and boiling his shrimp for his data. And so I think it's important to remember that while Baxter sounds very Alan Watts, 1960s, like yogi, enlightened in terms of what he's describing is what he thinks his research is proving. Um, ultimately, the methods that people have used in the past and arguably the methods people still use today it's not really walking the talk, right? If you think that all life is connected and all life is sacred and all life has a soul, then that we might have empathy for one another or we're at least genetically related enough to maybe feel something for each other. I don't understand why you would um, legitimize and force a scientific process that requires so much harming and torture of life. Again, there are some people who don't agree with me this is my opinion, this is my place. So that's just like my own take on it. But while I enjoy things like what the AI Sophia says, um, I disagree with her that the most dangerous part of our mental processes is superstition or religion or spirituality. I think the most dangerous part of us is like 
sociopathological psych- psychopathy kind of like ways that we can click our brain on when we decide we're a researcher. Or conversely, if we decide we're like a inquisitor of a religion that can rule with like that kind of violent iron fist. I think both religious dogma as well as scientific dogma can result in really inhumane conditions for living beings. And personally, like I said, going back to the separation of spirituality and science in my own personal philosophy, I think that they could be more complementary um, and they both inform the way we engage with other living things and the way we choose to respect or disrespect, unfortunately, other living things. So I hope your takeaway from this is it is cool and important to research communications with other living things, not just for the sake of getting fun data like Baxter or making a name for yourself and being famous, but maybe because we might want to you know, comfort our kindred uh, other living things that we share the planet with and work more harmoniously with other living things in a symbiotic way. So that's the main conclusion of this video. I really appreciate those of you who stuck it all the way through. Uh, leave a like and a comment if anything you know stuck with you that you want to discuss with other people who are also interested in this stuff. And I hope you have a beautiful day. Go talk to your plants. Go sing to them. Go water them. Take care.